Five Nights at Freddy's fan games are completely unhinged. Now I know this is probably not news to many of you, but it was to me. You see, I've never played a single FNAF fan game in my whole miserable life. Hell, I've never even played an actual Five Nights at Freddy's game other than the first one. Blasphemy, I know. But with the FNAF movie having come out a few weeks ago, I thought it would be a perfect time for me to change that and take a look at the different aspect the franchise is known for. The absurd amount of fan games that it spawned. Simply just looking up Five Nights at on Game Jolt gives you more than 10,000 results. It's over 9,000! So I went ahead and downloaded 10 different games. Some that you guys recommended to me, yeah. and some that I thought looked interesting. And we're gonna play those today. Links to all of these games will be in the description in case you want to play any of them yourself. And with that said, without wasting any more time, join me as I take a look at Five Nights at Freddy's fan games for the first time in my life. One Night at Flumpties is a game that a lot of you guys recommended to me, and I can see why. This game has some really good production quality. It's a parody of FNAF 1 and plays very similar to it. So similar in fact that you can almost call it a reskin, albeit a very funny and good looking one. The game opens up with a phone call from Flumpty Bumpty, the game's main antagonist, telling you that he's coming after you and that it's up to you to figure things out. He also says that he's immune to the plot and can transcend space and time. Hi, I'm Flumpty Bumpty. I'm an egg. I'm immune to the plot and I can transcend time and space. Now at first I thought this was just meant as a joke, but Flumpty really wasn't lying. He pretty much acts the exact same as Bonnie in FNAF 1, being able to basically teleport to wherever he wants in the building at random. It happened multiple times where the first thing he did after leaving his starting position at the beginning of the night was just teleport straight to my door. Fuck off! The other enemies in this game are Birthday Boy Blam, who acts like this game's Chica and has a remarkable fashion sense. Oh damn, that is one sophisticated gentleman. He slowly makes his way towards your office room for room and returns to his starting position every time he's held off successfully. And then there's this game's Foxy, a beaver who sits on the toilet taking a big old dump. I'm in the toilet taking a shit. Instead of slowly creeping out from behind the curtains like Foxy does, the beaver instead slowly runs out of toilet paper. And once he does, he comes sprinting towards your right door, after which you only have a couple of seconds to close it before he catches you. There's this broken camera in the top right corner of the map, Cam 3 to be exact, that shows you nothing but static up until halfway through the night. In the second half, the camera starts working again and you can see a room filled with lava. This is when the red man starts to appear. I wasn't really able to figure out what his cycle was to be honest, I could never actually see him on any of the cameras, but he'd sometimes appear at the left door, seemingly at random. I'd just close the door on him and after a while you'd hear this sound, indicating that he had left. <laughs> Something else I wasn't really able to figure out is this hole on Cam 5 that has a bunch of eyeballs in it. I don't know if there actually is a purpose to it, or if it's just for looks, pun intended. So if any of you guys do, then please let me know. Then there's Grunkfuss the Clown. Yes, that's his actual name, it's in the credits. He only starts to appear after 4am and slowly makes his way towards you from this hole in the wall. He comes a little bit closer with every time you open the cameras, preventing you from looking at them too often. And last but not least, there's Golden Flumpty. Unsurprisingly, he acts the exact same as Golden Freddy. If he appears in your office, which actually happened quite a few times, you have to flip up your cameras to prevent him from jump scaring you. The office itself is filled with tons of references to different franchises, such as Dr. Mario and Winnie the Pooh. The wallpaper has Metroids on it. There's the Pixar ball, a painting of Ronald McDonald that says honk if you click on his nose. Honk. And my personal favorite, the DK Crew. Honk. There's also this cactus, and if you click on it, it says, I am a cactus. I am a cactus. I, I don't know why it's there, but I do appreciate the cactus clearing up any possible confusion there might be as to what it is. As the name One Night at Flumpty suggests, the game is only one night long, which in my opinion works in its favor. Because the gameplay is so similar to Five Nights at Freddy's 1, limiting the game to one night makes it so that the game doesn't overstay its welcome, which is more than I can say for some of the later games I'll be playing in this video. All in all, I really enjoyed this game. It's short, sweet, and I dig the art style. If I had to describe this game in one word, it would be exquisite. <laughs> There's also an updated version of the game that for some reason removed all the references in the office and has a hard mode called hard boiled mode that unlocks after you complete the first night. I actually did unlock and play it while recording gameplay for this video, only when I tried looking at it afterwards I realized my recording software had been recording the wrong monitor the entire time. On top of that, the game didn't save for some reason, so uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not doing that again. I hope you guys understand. So let's move on to the next game. Pop 
Poppy and Buddies takes place at a restaurant called Buzzing Bee Productions. Bit of a weird name for a restaurant, but okay. The game opens up with a pre-recorded message from the company. According to this message, the animatronics in this game aren't malfunctioning or haunted or anything like that. No, they're intentionally programmed by the company to come after you during the night to prevent you from, and I quote, slacking off. However, of course, we disregard the idea of slacking off. This is why you'll be put up against our two animatronic mascots. Uh, now me personally, I'm not a lawyer, but that does sound like an easy lawsuit to me. There are only two nights in this game, and on the first night, the animatronics we'll be facing are Poppy the Bee and Arnie the Ant. Poppy will make his way to the right side of your office room for room, and when he does, you have to shine your flashlight at him until he leaves. I have to give mad props to whoever designed Poppy, because him standing in your office door looks absolutely terrifying. Look at this. I think he's about to appear, let me see. Hey, what is that? Fuck off, man. Ugh. And then there's Arnie the Ant, who will be moving through the building at random. In order to hold him off, you have to find him on the cameras and press this sound boom button in the bottom right corner when you do, which will send him back to the stage. Simple, easy, no problems on the first night. The second night, however, is a completely different story, because on night two, we're introduced to two new animatronics. Laylee the Ladybug and Melissa the Mime Spider. Now Laylee the Ladybug isn't really a problem. She'll randomly appear on the cameras every now and then and to avoid her, you just have to flip down the cameras before she jump scares you. Easy, no problem at all. Now the problem is with the second animatronic introduced on night 2, Melissa the Mime Spider. See Melissa will randomly appear in your office throughout the night and to prevent her from catching you, you have to turn off the lights whenever she appears in your office by holding the space bar. Now this in and of itself isn't really all that difficult, but here's the problem. I tried finishing night 2 for about 45 minutes, and the same exact thing would happen to me every single time. See, Poppy the Bee follows the same path to your office every time. Because of this, it's pretty easy to predict when he's about to appear at the right office door. But every damn time, at some point during the night, Melissa would appear in my office just before Poppy made his way to the door, or just as Poppy had already made his way to the door. And because this game has no doors to close, the only choice I had was either flash my light at Poppy and get killed by Melissa, or turn off the office lights and get killed by Poppy. Like I said, I tried this for about 45 minutes, and this would happen every single time. I don't know if I was doing something wrong or if it was just really unlucky, but eventually I got frustrated and stopped trying. But overall, I still had a good time with this game. The animatronics are really well designed, they look pretty unnerving. Especially Poppy. Why are you so fucking ugly, bro? I highly recommend trying the game out for yourself if you haven't already and see if you have better luck than I did. I swear, if I see a bunch of comments from people saying that they were able to beat it on their first try, I'm gonna absolutely flip out. Five Nights at Treasure Island is another game that was recommended to me a lot by you guys. It's based on one of the most popular creepypastas from back in the day, Abandoned by Disney, which is about an abandoned Disney resort called Treasure Island and has these costumes that can come to life. While in this game you work for the Supernatural Studies Association, who are running an investigation on the island, and your task is to guard the place during the night and collect data for the researchers. I think most of you have probably played or at least seen this game before, since it was one of the first FNAF fan games ever made, and definitely the first one to ever get really big. So in an attempt to keep things interesting, I decided to play the remake of the game instead of the original, because chances are fewer people have seen that. The controls for this game are pretty easy. There are three things you can do. You can press and hold control to hold your breath and stand still. You can press shift to turn off the office lights, which also saves power. And you can press the space bar when you have your cameras opened to shut one of them off. The latter option is really the only one you have to use on night one, as it is used to get rid of the only costume coming after you that night. Negative Mickey. <gasps> Negative Mickey is blind and he only reacts to sound, so to get rid of him when he enters your office, you have to quickly pull up your cameras and shut one of them off, which makes a loud sound, causing him to leave. I also quickly learned that leaving the office lights off for too long caused them to break, which leaves you in complete darkness for the rest of the night, with no way of defending yourself. So that's fun. Anyway, nothing too complicated on the first night. If Mickey enters your office, you turn off a camera, he leaves, and that's really it. On the second night, there are two extra costumes that appear throughout it. Oswald the Rabbit, and a disembodied dong of duck head that screams at you really loud every time he appears. Oh come on man, why does this thing have to be so damn loud? Shut the fuck up, you bitch! Ah! 
You get rid of both of them in the exact same way as you do Mickey. You flip up your camera system, turn off a camera, and they leave. Again, really easy. Nothing too interesting happened on night 2, so let's move on to night 3. Once again, there are two new costumes introduced on the third night. Minnie Mouse and Goofy. To get rid of Minnie, you just do the exact same thing as all the other characters introduced up to that point. And I think saying that the mechanic was starting to get a little repetitive by then is an understatement. Thankfully, Goofy does have a new mechanic. To get rid of him after he has entered your office, you have to press control to hold your breath and sit still. I don't think you have to turn off the lights as well, but I did do it just in case. Now, here's my main problem with this game. I think they tried to balance it a bit by making it so that in order to get rid of most of the costumes, you have to sacrifice some of your visibility of the building by shutting off one of the cameras. This of course makes it harder for you to know where the costumes are and predict when they're about to enter your office. But I think the developers of this game kinda overlooked the fact that this doesn't actually matter at all. See, even if you know that one of the costumes is about to enter your office, there's nothing that you can actually do with that information, since there's no way to prevent them from coming in. There are no doors or anything like that, so even if you know they're about to enter your office, you still have to wait for them to actually do so before you're able to act on it, which in turn makes the entire camera system basically useless. In theory, you could just sit still the entire time, wait for a costume to enter your office, and only pull up your camera system to shut one off every once in a while. I do really like the aesthetic of this game, the graphics look good, and the costumes are designed really well, but it was just a little boring to be honest, and on night 3 I accidentally broke my light at 5am because I kept them off for too long, which caused me to get caught a couple of seconds before the night was over, which kinda annoyed me, so I quit. I don't know if maybe the later nights of this game are any better, and I missed out on a whole bunch of stuff. If that is the case, then be sure to let me know, and maybe I'll revisit it someday, but from what I did experience, I highly doubt it. So for now, let's move on to the next game. Okay, I don't know why I downloaded this, alright? Look, I saw Thomas the Tank Engine, and my cursor was pretty much already subconsciously hovering over the download button. I'm sorry. This game takes place at a restaurant called Thomas's Pizza Railway, and has some of the best voice acting I've ever heard in a video game. Hello, and welcome to <laughs> Bro, what is that voice? Hello! I'll be your <laughs> there are really only two things you have to do in this game, and that's putting coal in the furnace to prevent your power from running out, and shutting the door whenever Thomas shows up in the hallway. Or don't shut the door and hope for the best, because sometimes he just leaves on his own. I wonder how long it takes for him to actually attack you if you don't shut the door fast enough. Oh, no. <laughs> Never mind, he left. Yeah, this, uh, this might be one of the best games I've ever played in my life. Um, it's definitely the best game in this video by far. I, I mean, you might as well just click off now because it, it really doesn't get any better than this. I rate this game 10 Percy's out of 10. And uh, with that said, we're going to move on to the next game. Does he actually attack you eventually or does he just keep standing there staring at you? Ah! Five Nights at the Back Rooms is a game I downloaded because I thought it had an interesting premise. Being trapped in the back rooms with FNAF animatronics. The game opens up with a newspaper article about a kid named Andrew Afton, the character we'll be playing as. The article says that Andrew was filming a short film with his friends before he suddenly disappeared and that none of his friends knew what exactly happened to him. The article under that says that the animatronics from Freddy Fazbear's Pizza also suddenly went missing after performing normally on stage. You then get to play as Andrew, and the goal of the game is to survive a full night in different levels of the back rooms, and then make your way to an elevator once it's 6am to progress to the next level. One night only takes 3 minutes, so it goes by pretty quick. In the first level, it's Freddy who'll be roaming around the place. After locating the elevator door, I saw that there were a bunch of pillars right next to it. So I came up with this brilliant plan of just standing behind one of them until Freddy made his way over to me and then walk around it to stay out of his line of sight, which worked perfectly and luckily for me, he only came over there once, so once it hit 6am, I was right next to the elevator, giving me a quick and easy escape. On the second level however, I did run into a couple of problems. The first one happened right away, as once the elevator doors opened, I was instantly spawn killed by Bonnie. Oh, what the? Hey, old Bonnie, chill, man. Hey, what the hell? What was I supposed to do against that? Luckily, on my second try, I was able to leave the elevator. But as soon as I wanted to walk into the big open area, I got instantly spotted. So on my third attempt, I thought, you know what? I'll just stay in the beginning area where the elevator is, and if Bunny does come here, I'll just walk around the pillar again like I did with Freddy. But I found out the hard way that the developer of this game wasn't a fan of campers. 
because if you stand still in one spot for longer than one in-game hour, you will get ambushed and absolutely demolished by Golden Freddy. What the? No! Huh. I really thought I had this game figured out. So I thought, fine, you got me there. And on my final attempt, I just did the same strategy, only this time I kept walking circles around the pillar. And that worked. Golden Freddy didn't show up this time, and luckily, neither did Bonnie. So once it was 6am, I had a clear path to the elevator. And just like that, I moved on to the third level of the game, where you'll be going up against Chica. It takes place in some sort of maze that I couldn't really make much sense of. I tried finding my way through it twice, but the thing is, if you do come across Chica here, there's really nowhere to run. You're just kinda screwed. So I thought trying to avoid coming across her in the first place was probably the best strategy here. So I made my way to one of the corners of the map, which conveniently also was very close to the elevator, and hoped that I could make it to 6am without Chica making her way to this corner of the map. And luckily she didn't, so once it was 6am, I made my way back to the elevator and moved on to level 4. Here you'll have to try and avoid Foxy, and when you walk out of the elevator, you end up in this hallway with a little corner at the end of it where you can hide. So with the vast amount of knowledge I'd gained from playing the previous levels, I figured the best way to approach this was to just stay in the hallway and hope Foxy would simply stay away. And that worked out fairly well. I did see Foxy once, but he didn't really do anything. He just stepped into the hallway, stared at the wall for a few seconds, and then left again. What are you staring at, fucker? So once again, when it was 6am, I had a clear path to the elevator and moved on to the final night, night 5. Now this night had quite the difficulty curve, because instead of having to avoid one animatronic, you now have to avoid all four of them. So because of this, walking around isn't really an option, because you're bound to run into at least one of them at some point. Or all four at the same time, like I did here. Oh shit, I have to get out of here because he's gonna turn around and see me. But Freddy's here too. I'm screwed. Please, Freddy. Oh, nope. I'm screwed. Wait, what? I'm still alive? Foxy, no! Oh, come on. Look! Chica was there too. They ganged up on me. I got jumped. Eventually, I did find a somewhat reliable hiding spot. And after trying for almost half an hour, I was able to make it to 6 a.m. And I got a little nervous after that, because I still had to find my way back to the elevator and didn't really know how. But I found out soon enough that I didn't have to, because the ending of this game is to get ambushed by Golden Freddy and die. Oh, I made it. Let's go. I swear, if I die now, I'm gonna be so pissed. What the? No! Are you serious? What was that? Yeah, uh, a little anticlimactic to say the least. I went through 30 minutes of pure stress for a scripted death. My disappointment is immeasurable. And my day is ruined. Yeah, I could really use a game that can calm me down a little after this stressful experience. <sighs> Fuck it. Aw oh shit, I'm out of tissues. The Tubbyland Archives is definitely the game I look forward to playing the most in this video. Judging from the game's game jolt page, I could tell that a lot of effort was put into making this game. The graphics look really good, especially for a fan game, and the animatronics look very detailed and well designed. After making my Slendy Tubbies video, I really thought I had heard every possible curse remix of the Teletubbies theme, but I was wrong. This game had another one. The game takes place in an old abandoned restaurant called Tubbyland that was themed around the Teletubbies. You work as a security guard for an engineering company that is trying to get the animatronics back up and running again for some reason. The game has quite a few mechanics in it, so let me go ahead and explain those first. Your main office has two entry points, one on your left and one right in front of you, neither of which have doors that you can close. On your right there's a curtain that you can hide behind, which you won't have to use on the first night, but you will later on. With this bar on the far left, you can access your camera system, where there are several extra things that you can do. The rooms in the restaurant are really dark, so in order to be able to see anything, you'll have to use a flashlight, which you can turn on by using the button with the light bulb on it in the bottom left corner. Using your flashlight is also the only thing that'll make you lose power, so you'll have to use it sparingly. Above that there's a button with a lightning bolt on it, which is used to reboot the camera after it has shut off randomly during the night. This won't happen on night 1, but during the later nights it'll happen pretty much every 5 seconds or so. 
And finally, we have a speaker system. If you click this button, a sound will play, attracting Teletubbies to the room you play it in. The speaker also has a cooldown on it, so that you're not able to spam it. There's one little detail about this mechanic that the game doesn't explain to you, and I actually had to look it up online after I kept dying and couldn't figure out why. But this only works if you play the sound in a room next to the one a Teletubby is currently in, otherwise it won't do anything. Not much of a problem when you know this, but it would have been nice if the game was a little clearer on that small but very important detail. Anyway, with all that explained, let's actually get into Night 1. On Night 1, the only Teletubby you'll be going up against is Poe. To keep her away from your office, you have to use the speaker system, making that the only mechanic you have to use throughout this night. So after I'd found out that the speaker will only work if you play it in the room next to the one Poe is currently in, making it to 6am was absolutely no problem at all. After every night, you get to play a little mini game. In the first mini game, you get to play as Dipsy and are tasked with finding Nunu. I looked around for a bit and eventually found him taking a nap in some random closet, which woke him up. After that, you get to play the second night. At the start of the night, the phone guy tells you that during the day, they got two extra animatronics working again. Those being Nunu and one that the phone guy calls the one without the head. Now, because of Slendy Tubbies, this instantly made me think it was Dipsy since he has no head in that game. But no, in this game, it's Lala who doesn't have a head. Lala doesn't react to the speaker system or any of the other things that you have at your disposal. Instead, what you have to do is keep track of her movement at all times. There are two rooms that lead into your office, those being 1A and 1B. If she appears on either of these cameras, there is a high chance that she'll come into your office next. So once you can no longer see her on those cameras, you have a small window of time to hide behind the curtain on the right side of your office before you get killed. If you do this successfully, you'll get this really cool looking animation of Lala stepping into your office and looking around for a bit. After this, she'll leave your office again and you can get back to business. As for Nunu, I don't really know where or when he shows up to be honest. The phone guy does say that he's there, but I never saw him during any of the nights. Maybe I'm a little stupid and I just missed him, but if anyone knows for sure, then be sure to let me know. This is also the first night where some of your cameras will randomly start shutting off throughout the night. Still fairly manageable for now, as it didn't happen too often, and you don't have that many animatronics to keep track of, but definitely already a little annoying. Another thing that was starting to get really annoying was the speaker system. I don't know if I was doing something wrong or not, if so then my bad, I'd take all of this back, but I'm pretty sure I wasn't. Quite a few times it happened where Poe just didn't react to the speaker at all, even if I played it in the room next to the one she was currently in. Like here for example. Poe is in room 1B, the room next to my office. I used the speaker in room 3B, which is next to room 1B. And she doesn't give a shit. She just stares right into the camera, taunting me. I'm about to end this man's whole career. And then she kills me. Again, and again, and again. And this is only night 2, mind you, and I was already having trouble with it. Eventually, however, I was able to make it and got to play the second mini game. This time you play as Poe and are once again tasked with finding Nunu. Didn't take me long to find him and I caught him performing a little souk on the custard machine. <laughs> on night 3, Tinky Winky will also be joining in on the fun. On the previous two nights, you could already see him lying on the floor in camera 4A. However, now he's activated and what you have to do to prevent him from getting into your office is shine your flashlight at him for a while whenever you see him on one of the cameras. This makes a loud noise, which he apparently doesn't like for some reason, causing him to return to his starting position. I have no idea how, considering the amount of trouble I had with night 2, but by some miracle I was able to complete this night on the first try. I guess the game just felt sorry for me or something. In the third minigame you play as Lala, and when you find Nunu, he's taken out the trash. I don't know if these minigames actually go anywhere, I'm sure they do, but we won't be finding out in this video, because I could not beat night 4. I think I used up all my luck on the third night, as I tried beating night 4 for almost 45 minutes, but I just couldn't. On night 4, Dipsy will also be activated, and to be completely honest with you, I wasn't even able to figure out how he works after 45 minutes of trying. Sometimes I could see his eye glowing in the doorway in front of me, but he never seemed to actually do anything as far as I could tell. Maybe he does eventually, but I think I was just never able to make it far enough into the night for him to start doing anything before I got killed. It was just too much, honestly. The animatronics seemed way more aggressive than on previous nights. Cameras were shutting off left and right every 10 seconds. And then I was trying to figure out how Dipsy works on top of that. On my last attempt, I was able to make it to 5am, which gave me a sliver of hope. But then I got killed by Poe, which pissed me off and I gave up. 
It's kind of a shame really because this game looks amazing and has some really cool gameplay ideas. I also really like the animation of Lala entering and looking around your office. But the only thing holding it down for me is the difficulty. It's just way too hard. Don't get me wrong, I do like a challenge, but you have to be careful with stuff like that when it comes to horror games. Or at least in my opinion. Because when a section of a horror game is so difficult that you have to play it over and over again before you're able to beat it, it loses all of its scariness real fast and quickly turns into nothing but frustration. Which I don't think is what you're going for when you decide to make a horror game. I swear, I can already see all the Gitkun and skill issue comments in my mind. Anyway, let's move on to the next game. Five Nights at Wario's is the final game I'll be playing in this video that was recommended to me by you guys. And um, I'm about to drop a really hot take here, so get ready for it. It sucks. Very controversial opinion, I know. Let me quickly explain the story of this game first. Wario and Waluigi one day decided to open their own fast food factory called Wario's Fast Food Factory. Wow, really wonder how long it took for them to come up with that one. One day after work, they were never seen leaving the factory and no one knew where they went. That same night, Mario and Luigi decided to go into the factory to look for them, but they too were never seen or heard from again. In turn, Princess Peach then went into the factory to look for Mario and Luigi, but in a shocking turn of events, she also went missing. Wow, what a twist. Not really. Due to the thought of the factory being haunted, it was eventually closed and left abandoned for seven years until someone decided to get the factory back up and running again. You now work at the factory as a security guard during the night and have to defend yourself against all the Mario characters' ghosts that are still haunting the place. Gameplay-wise, it's literally just Five Nights at Freddy's 1. No original ideas whatsoever. I mean, even the Thomas the Tank Engine game had an original mechanic in it with the coal, so there's really no excuse for this one. The setting, too, makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, of all the possible places you can pick within the Mario universe, the developer instead decided to go with a random-ass, completely unrelated factory. It makes absolutely no sense why there are even Mario characters in this in the first place. And speaking of the characters, they're pretty much just slightly altered versions of the Smash Bros. Brawl models. And not altered in a scary way, if anything, it's just goofy. I mean, let's take a look at them, shall we? Wario is just Wario, except with no pupils. Waluigi has his limbs stretched. Mario has no head. Peach has her mouth stretched and her eyes blacked out. And Luigi, well, uh... I don't know, you tell me what happened to Luigi, because I don't even know what I'm looking at to be honest. So yeah, the story is pretty bad, the setting makes no sense, the gameplay is unoriginal, the character models downright suck, but you know what? I would have been fine with all of this if this was simply made as a joke. You know, a bit of a goof. And I might be completely wrong in saying this, but I don't think that was the intention behind this game. This game, at least to me, gives off the vibe that it wants to be taken seriously and was genuinely made with the intention to be scary. One Night at Flumpty's, for example, while also being an exact copy of FNAF 1 gameplay-wise, worked because it didn't take itself seriously. It knew exactly what it was, a parody, and embraced that fully. Hell, even a game like Five Nights at Thomas's honestly was more enjoyable to me than this game, simply because it was made as a joke and was never made with the intention of being taken seriously. Sure, you wouldn't play that game for longer than 10 minutes, if even that, but it would be an enjoyable 10 minutes and you get a little laugh out of it, but this game just feels like it really wants to be scary, and because it fails in that aspect, it really has nothing else going for it, it's just bad. And I totally get being scared of this game if you're a kid or something, so in case you're one of the people watching this that was scared of this game back in the day, there's no need to be ashamed. I mean, I'm not proud to admit this, but I was genuinely scared of the Sonic.exe game back in the day. So I have absolutely no right to judge anyone for stuff like this. However, something that'll always remain funny to me is watching grown-ass adults play games like this while trying to act scared by still PNGs of Mario characters. This is my personal favorite one. And the Oscar goes to... Where is Wario? I don't know where he is. I can't see him anywhere. Ah! What's it? Oh, my heart fucking stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the next game. While I was looking for games on Game Jolt, I came across a game called Five Nights at Freddy's 1 Playable Animatronics, which sounded like a pretty cool concept to me, so I downloaded it. As the name suggests, you get to play as the animatronics, and you can even pick which one you want to play as. 
There's the main four animatronics, Freddy, Bonnie, Chica and Foxy, and you can also play as the endoskeleton in the costume room. There's also a free roam mode where you get to play as the security guard and are free to explore the place. The FNAF 1 restaurant is remade here in its entirety and the models of the animatronics look really good. After walking through the restaurant for a bit to get a good sense of the map layout, it was time to actually try out playing as one of the animatronics. The goal of the game is obviously to try and kill the security guard before 6am. On my first try I picked Freddy and when I spawned in I immediately started making my way to the office. After getting there I was expecting the security guard to do something, like anything at all, but uh, I was just able to walk straight into the office and he just kinda sat there and accepted his fate. Why are you bullying me? So I thought alright, let's try this again. I picked Bonnie and when I got to the office this time he actually closed the door on me which teleported me back to the stage. I then tried getting into the office from the other side and I was once again able to walk right in. Honestly, I don't really know what I was expecting when I read playable animatronics because when you think about it, what did the animatronics really do in FNAF 1? But I don't know, as of right now this game seems more like a demo to me. Maybe it would be cool if this was a multiplayer game or something, where one person played as a security guard and the others played as the animatronics. Kind of like a reverse Friday the 13th or Dead by Daylight or something. Except instead of one killer and multiple survivors, there's one survivor and multiple killers. Maybe something like that already exists, cause it does kinda sound like an idea somebody out there would've already had before me. But maybe one of you guys knows if a game like that already exists, and if it does, I I'd love to know cause that sounds really cool. But as for now, there's really not much else to do in this game. So let's move on to the next one. Yo, real quick by the way, uh, if you play as Foxy in this game, you can actually sprint. So I'm gonna attempt speedrunning this game real quick, check this out. Boom! Sub 7 seconds, that's gotta be a world record. Somebody notify speedrun.com. Easy speezy, you better watch out man, I'm coming for your spot. Ah, just like that, we've already made it to the final game of the video. What a journey it's been, right? We've played some good games, some not so good games, and now we're going to play the final game. And are we going to end this video off on a high note? No. In Five Nights at the Krusty Krab, the Krusty Krab has become a chain restaurant. These restaurants are all modeled after the original Krusty Krab and have robot versions of the original staff members. Mostly because this is cheaper than hiring actual employees. I have to give the developer props for that, that sounds like a very in-character thing for Mr. Krabs to do. The robots in this restaurant are Spongebob, Squidward, Mr. Krabs, Sandy and Patrick. And uh, I don't know how they did it, but they somehow managed to make robot Patrick look even derpier than actual Patrick. I think the game itself looks fine and I like the way the robot animatronics look. They're not scary per se, but in a weird way they look like something you'd see on the actual show. The phone guy tells us that the robots draw electricity from outside sources to save costs on their power. Again, seems very in character for Mr. Krabs. So when your office lights start flickering, you know one of the robots is close to your office. Your office has two entry points, a left and a right door, both of which you can close. There's also a window in front of you where the robots can appear, and if that happens you have to shine your flashlight at them to make them go away. However, on night one, absolutely nothing happened at all. Some of the robots did move, but none of them ever made it to my office, so that was a little boring. On night two, there's an extra thing to keep in mind. The phone guy tells you about the fuse room on cam 7. This room also has a door and a flashlight just like your office, and you have to try and prevent the robots from entering this room. If they do enter, they'll start messing with your power supply, which can lead to you no longer being able to use the lights in your office or close any of the doors, giving the other robots a clear path right into your office. This didn't happen on night 2, but it did later on. What did happen on night 2 however is this. Sandy appeared at my right door at 2am. Obviously I closed the door on her and figured that she'd eventually go away. Only the thing is, she never did. I even tried flashing the light at her multiple times, but she didn't really seem to care whatsoever. She stayed at my door from 2am to the end of the night. Luckily for me, no one else showed up at the left door during night 2, otherwise I don't think I would've had enough power to make it to 6am. So I don't know if I was just doing something wrong or not, but I think it was unintentional. At the beginning of night 3, everything was going well at first, but then the exact same thing happened again, only this time she showed up an hour later. Still, she wouldn't leave no matter what I did, so I had to keep my door shut for the rest of the night. Then on night 4, instead of coming to my office, she went into the fuse room and wouldn't leave from there. Again, maybe it's just due to my lack of functioning brain cells, but if there is a way to get the robots to leave, I wasn't able to figure it out. The phone guy doesn't tell you either, all he says is to shine your flashlight at him. 
but that never worked for me. And that's really the only option you have. So the only conclusion I can draw from this is that the game is broken! Anyway, because Sandy wouldn't leave the fuse room, I wasn't able to close the office doors, and at 4 a.m., Mr. Krabs got me, which caused me to say, That's it! I quit! And just like that, I went from having played zero Five Nights at Freddy's fan games to having played 10 of them. Did I have fun? Yes. Mostly. Oh, are you serious? I'm getting sick and tired of this game. What the fuck? No, in all seriousness, I hope you enjoyed watching the video as much as I enjoyed making it. If there are any other good fan games that I haven't played in this video, then be sure to let me know. And who knows? If this video does well, maybe I'll make a part two in the future. Also, sorry if I sounded a little sick throughout the video. Uh, if I did, it's because I was. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm doing fine. Thanks for asking. Anyway, if you're still here, thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to check out some of my other videos if you enjoyed this one. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And hopefully, I'll see you guys in a future video. But for now, I'm out. Later, people.